know what the best part of preaching is? I get to take my mask off. <gasps> That's not true, but it sure is nice. I'm just not designed for masks. Thank you, Rick. Oh, I'm going to steal a thing from you. Share something, eh, Anna, or Mandy, or whoever's there. It's all me. It's all me. Good. Oh, it's on. There we go. Am I on? There we go. Okay, now go here. Go here and go. Come on, where are you? Where's the slide? Home. No, slideshow from the start. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. You're here. We're here. It's been said. I think it's been said. I'm going to, at least I said it. Okay. So there, it's been said. Uh, context is everything. That knowing, that is, context meaning that knowing what really is going on. And with it is perspective. That is, how we look at things. Take, for instance, the woman at McDonald's in Penticton trying to enjoy her McDonald's lunch, and I know that some of you are saying, enjoy McDonald's? Is that possible in the yes. same sentence? Yes. <laughs> trying to enjoy her McDonald's hamburger, and I say trying because sitting nearby her is a distraught mother with three children, a distraught mother with three children, one of which is an infant, and she clearly does not know how to have control of them, and she does not have control of them. And the two other older kids are making lots of noises, they're moving around lots, they're making a mess, they're making the, the that area of the, the restaurant an unpeaceable place. And then, to top it off, this mother, in an attempt to get what looked like a baby no more than a few months old, in order to get this baby to stop crying, gives her a french fry. And this woman observing this terrible demonstration of motherhood desperately wants to give this mom a piece of her mind. I'm sure none of us moms, you moms out there have had that experience. But thankfully, she didn't. It was only later on that afternoon that she learned that this mom wasn't the kid's mom at all. In fact, it was a single lady who had never had kids. And the reason she was taking care of these ones was because these kids' mothers, mother had just been killed in a car accident that morning. And the single lady was barely holding it together at the loss of her relative, and in an act of desperation had taken the children to McDonald's to create a distraction. Context. Perspective. Knowing the context gave a whole different perspective to the woman. From, from judging and wanting to give the mom a few instructions, a what to, a piece of her mind, to sorrow and great compassion for what this woman must be going through and these children. Context. Perspective. Or as Daryl Johnson is so fond of saying, things are not as they seem. He says this in the context of, 
of faith. That we as people of faith live and believe by things that are not seen. As followers of Jesus, this could be our per perspective statement. As followers of Jesus, context is everything and so is perspective. The small group of people the preacher of Hebrews was speaking to were struggling with perspective. Why? Because they were finding themselves losing sight of their contexts. Because the troubles of this world was causing them to lose their perspective. And all they could see was this world and what was happening in this world, in their world, and it was not good. In fact, they were thinking and maybe receiving some pressure from others if we just remove Jesus from the equation. If we just remove Jesus from our world, the troubles in our world will subside and then we could get some rest, we could get some peace, and some prosperity back as well. But you know what? Man doesn't need perspective, sorry, persecution or, or difficulties or shattered dreams to encounter a loss of perspective. The book of Hebrews, not to mention most of Scripture, is an affront to our scientific modern Western minds. Though as science is increasingly realizing, we truly are fearfully and wonderfully made, and science is slowly and at times begrudgingly coming to realize that creation screams out. It screams out saying, don't you see? I could not have happened without an intelligent designer. Still, the preacher, the preacher has taken us through this whirlwind of seemingly unscientific and just plain weird things. Angels, the majesty on high, miracles, God becoming human, the devil, judgment, high priests, weird rituals, religious practices, Melchizedek, whoever in the world he is, Old tabernacle with its weird, bloody practices. A new tabernacle that is in somewhere up there, I think. I don't know. The sacrifice of Jesus for our sins that is once and for all. What? All? Once? All? His resurrection from the dead. Jesus' ascension leading the way into the very presence of God the Father. The call for those of us who believe to boldly enter the tabernacle, to, into the heavenlies, into the holy of holies, into the very presence of God. Like, what does that mean? And how does one do it? Is it like a, a beam me up, Scotty? That's what comes to my mind. Like, somehow a transporter seems more plausible to our scientific mind than what the author of Hebrews is telling us. And living in the presence of the Father in heaven, that we are called to take up our role as priests on earth, that we, are, that we would be so heavenly minded that we would be lots of earthly good. Context. <sighs> to the outside eye, it can seem like a pathetic mother who cannot control her kids and should not be a mother. To the outside eye, our faith can seem ridiculous. Or as Paul put it, the story of Jesus is the stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness to the non-Jew. Context. Perspective. But to the eye of faith, to the eye of faith, faith that is rooted and grounded in the Word of God, the living Word of God, God Himself, that is grounded in God Himself, the God who, who revealed Himself to Moses. And even though the author doesn't speak to this text in his this is part of a sermon that we're looking at today. This has got to be in the background. 
when God, Moses said, please reveal yourself to me. And God says, okay, this is who I am. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. There's the celebration part. Woohoo! But equally celebratory is that he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Ouch! And yet, I am thankful as we shall see. You see, the faith that believes that there is more than we can see, the reality that there is more real than we can see, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working for our good, working that we might have abundant life, peace, and rest, and joy, and love, and wholeness, holiness, so that we fix our eyes on Jesus, knowing that He led the way, into the presence of the Father, and that he calls us to follow him there, to this place that we, we can't quite understand or figure out what it is exactly, but we are told is real. And we are told to go there. And we trust God as our good, good Father, strengthening our drooping hands and our weakened knees. We move on in a straight line, following Jesus, making choices to live in the reality of the peace and holiness Jesus died to bring, so that the things of this earth, the trials, the persecutions, the shattered dreams, the evil, the injustice, the, the sin, the lies, so that these things will grow strangely dim. What a great word, strangely dim. Like, like that's weird. <laughs> that they would grow strangely dim in what? In the light of his glory and grace. And all of this leads us to the climax of this sermon. That's just the introduction, sorry. <laughs> Our preacher is going to take us to two mountains today. The first mountain is Mount Sinai, and it represents the first covenant. The covenant that these people are thinking of returning to. The second mountain is Mount Zion, and it represents the co second covenant. The covenant that they are thinking of leaving Jesus is the initiator, the mediator of the second covenant. And they are thinking of leaving him because he's caused them a lot of problems in their eyes. Our preacher will then finish with the final warning and a call to live in the reality of that which we cannot see, to get our context right so that our perspective can also be right and thus fix our eyes on Jesus, the right perspective based on the context of the reality that exists beyond this temporary reality we live in. Let's pray. Wow, wow, Lord. Um, you, never, you didn't say it would be easy for us to understand. Um, and, uh, and yet I stand amazed at the simplicity of our faith that is a simply as, it's as simple as saying, God help me. And there is everything that I acknowledge God, I acknowledge you, I declare my need, and I call for help. And yet in that simple statement, in that simple heart prayer, behind that is the story of you working in all of history bring your salvation to us so that we might be your people, that you would have us where you started us with in company with you walking in the garden. 
And so we sit here today, a, a hodgepodge of people with a hodgepodge of mot motivations and, and, and struggles and situations. And as we come to your word, may your spirit speak to each of us where we are at. to strengthen and to encourage us in the way of Christ, to get perspective, to get context. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, <coughs> and will to move. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. The preacher begins our text today, which is, by the way, it's Hebrews 12, 18, if you have your Bibles, um, begins our text today by putting the word that he wants to emphasize right at the beginning. He does this a lot. It's a very common thing in Greek, that if you wanted to really focus on a word, you would put that word right at the beginning of your text. It didn't matter. Sentence order didn't matter so much. And so it was a emphatic way of communicating something. And the very first word he has in our text today is not. Not what? Not have you come to. Now that's a bit klutzy, but I wanted to make it klutzy for you. To make it, to give you the, communicate the literalness of it. It really would be, you have not come to. The preacher wants them to know that what he is about to say is not their experience. And not only that, but why in the world would they want to return to that experience? Because you're going to experience it in a second. And it's like, you want that? Seriously? So what is it that they have not come to? What is it that they have not experienced? Mount Sinai. Now, our text actually doesn't say Mount Sinai. In fact, it doesn't even mention the word mountain. The preacher, however, very clearly has this mountain in view. As any Jew, as they were listening, would have immediately been drawn to, in their minds, to, in this, to this mountain and the events that took place. Because what the preacher is about to describe are very specific events that happened at Mount Sinai. So the preacher says, you have not come to, and now what begins is this masterful waterfall of poetic description of what the Israelites experienced at Mount Sinai, a cacophony of, 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 of simple descriptions of what they experienced. And it begins with, you have not come to what may be touched. And immediately, you get a sense of what the situation here. There is a disconnect. God on the mountain, the people at the base of the mountain, and God says, don't you dare come near. You cannot touch this. Hmm. Lane writes that the preacher recreates the events of Israel's frightening experience in coming to Sinai, where they encountered God in the fiery epiphany the cumulative effect of the awesomeness of the, of the awesome description of the tangible and the threatening aspect of the scene is an indelible impression on the majestic presence of God who is unapproachable. And so our preacher says, you have not come to what may be touched. You have not come to a blazing fire. You have not come to darkness. Blazing fire. The, the, the picture of that, of, of the, the, the pillar of fire, but also the mountain that, that God, the picture is that on the top of the mountain there was thunder and lightning. There was this storm, this darkness that was happening. Can I ask a question? Yes, Chris. Just because it's confusing a bit, why is it that what may be touched when it was something that wasn't um, that's just the, I'm just doing it literally. Yeah, um, but it's the same. You have not come to what may be touched. In other words, you can't touch it. It's, it's just a. Okay, because it's like in the NIV, it says to a mountain that can be touched. So, I mean, I, I real, I know 
Okay, first off, Chris can't hear you. Chris can't, people can't hear you. Chris is wondering why is it what may be touched? Because it's saying you can't come, you can't touch this mountain. You can't come to this. This, this is not a mountain that can be touched. Okay, so this is a poetic thing. It is a poetic thing. Instead of what he's saying, is yeah. what you're saying? Well, it's not the opposite. You have not come to what may be touched. Okay. You, you haven't arrived at something that can be touched. Okay. Does that make sense? I know, I know. I, I, I wrestled with whether to change that, but I'm, it's... And, and this is in contrast, because he's going to both talk to something that can be touched, so to speak. Okay? okay? Yeah. So it's, it's a contrast here. This is, you can't, you have not come to something that can be touched. Okay. okay? Right there. That, no. Does that help? Okay. It would be easier to say it, you have come to what may not be touched. Yes, I know. And, and you're right, Fred. Fred says it would be easier to say, you, you how did you say just, Fred? You have, you, you, have come you have come to something that cannot be touched. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But however, in the whole paragraph, it becomes clear. It becomes clear. And so this is, a, this is for a very intentional thing on the author's part of where he's going, okay? Because he's going to be making two comparisons here. He's creating a picture. And the very first picture is this mountain is something that you cannot approach. You cannot touch it. It is disconnected. So with blazing fire, with darkness and to gloom, and to whirlwind, and to a trumpet blast. If you read the accounts I gave, asked you to read, you'd, you'd get that sense. Of, and there was this increasingly, increasingly trumpet blast, such that was very, a sound that was very, very overwhelming. The best thing I can think of there is, is our, our smoke detector, <laughs> when our smoke detector goes off because we're starting a fire and we forgot to open the door because our whatever. And, and it just goes off and you're trying and our dog is freaked out and our dog wants to escape and run out as fast as possible. And it, you're trying to do this because the, the sound is just awful. It's blaring in your eye, face and whatever else. But, and then a sound of words. And, and the word is that in, there was a, a sound that came out of that mountain, but it was not discernible. I want to just read, I'm going to read briefly just from that uh, part of the text I gave you from Deuteronomy 5, um, just to give you some specific experience in case you didn't get a chance to read it. When did you do this? When you, this is Deuteronomy 5.23, when you heard the voice of the darkness, while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes and our elders came to me, and you said, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen a person that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now, why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we haven't survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God, they're speaking to Moses here, right? Mm -hmm. Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord God, our God tells you, we will listen and obey. In other words, these people were so freaked out by what they encountered, by the God they encountered, they said, uh, yeah, you go ahead, Moses, you go ahead, we'll just stay back here. In the spectacle, we are told, so it made the beggar, hearers beg that no further message be given to them because they were unable to bear the command, if even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. And the spectacle was so awesome that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Possibly from Deuteronomy 9.19. Seven things, seven descriptions. Notice, each of them are very impersonal, right? Blazing fire, well, I guess if you're warm, that can be personal, you can be romantic, but this wasn't that kind of a blazing fire. All of them are very impersonal things. Even the sound of words, the way the Old Testament puts it, it was just a sound, it wasn't discernible. Contrast. 
culminating in an animal. If an animal touches, it shall be stoned. Well, what about us? Don't, we can't go there. And culminating that even Moses, who was going there, he himself was afraid and terrified. That's the one mountain, impersonal. It represents the first covenant that the author has referred to time and time again. The preacher, preacher began with, you have not come to Mount Sinai where the presence of God filled the people with fear and dread. But now he says, but on the contrary, you have come to Mount Zion. And Mount Zion is a radically different experience than Mount Sinai. Remember, these people are wanting to go back to, to Mount Sinai. And he's trying to say, uh, really, you want to go back to that? I'm going to give you a picture of what you'd be leaving in a moment. The word come was a significant word in Jewish worship. Worship. It was first used at Mount Sinai in the initiating of the covenant. In Deuteronomy 4, 9 to 14. We're not going to go there because of time. But it's a significant word in Hebrews. In fact, he's used it five times prior to this. He says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In 7.25, he says, he is able to save absolutely, in other words, fully and completely, those who draw near to God through him. The law, in 10.1, this is an example of, of what um, the law was unable to do, a comparison, but it's still the word draw near. The law can never, by the same sacrifice that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who come near. And then in 10.22, the, in command, uh, the invitation, the command again, let us draw near, let us come with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Trusting Jesus with our hearts sprinkled from a cl clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then in 11.6, that great chapter of faith, he says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. I forgot to put the, highlight the draw near and the come. I had the come in there. But whoever would come to God, this is what you must do. The verb is used exclusively of coming to God. So, what is this Mount Zion? In the Old Testament, it was a dwelling place of God. The preacher now gives a list of seven descriptions of Mount Zion to balance the seven descriptions given of Mount Sinai. Lane writes, and this is a lengthier quote I'm going to read to you, every aspect of the vision, of the vision that we're about to encounter, provides encouragement for coming boldly into the presence of God. That which he talked about in 416. The atmosphere in Mount Zion, rather than being fearful and impersonal, is festive. The frightening imagery of blazing fire and darkness and gloom fades before the reality of the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The cacophony of the, the whirlwind and the trumpet blast and the sound of words is muted and replaced by joyful praises of angels in a, in a festal gathering. The trembling congregation of Israel gathered solemnly at the base of the mountain is superseded by the the assembly of those who are gathered, whose names are permanently inscribed in the heavenly archives. You see, an overwhelming impression of the unapproachability of God in the first, co first covenant in the Mount Sinai description is eclipsed in the experience of the full access to the presence of God and of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. This is where context comes in, where things are not as they seem. So let's go to these brief seven descriptions. 
very first one is, you have come to Mount, on the contrary, you have come to Mount Zion, even to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. In scripture, Mount Zion and the city of Jerusalem are very closely connected. If you look it up in, in the online, seven of the 21 times that, that Mount Zion is referred to, the city of Jerusalem is also there, tied in. Guthrie writes that the two should be understood as conceptually synonymous, representing the dwelling place of God. This is the heavenly city of 1116 and the city that is to come of 1314. The place that is viewed here is not the earthly place, but it's a heavenly place, which is where the preacher of Hebrews has been seeking to take his listeners and us too. We have been on a journey in Hebrews. Jesus, he, he starts with Jesus, and then Jesus dies, and then he raises from the dead, and then he ascends to the Father, and there he is, and he's led the way for us led the way for us to also journey to where he is. And this is the culmination of the story, the culmination of the letter. The journey to the city of God, to where God is, to be his people, to be with him. This has been his heart's cry. It is the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, which if you want to read, by the way, I'm not going to go there, but if you read the beginning of Jeremiah 31, there's a description also of a joyous return from exile back to the promised land, to, to Jerusalem. And it sounds very much like this description. Because, of course, back then Jerusalem demonstrated the, 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 the place of God, the presence of God. Onward. To, number two is to innumerable com companies of, Israel, of angels, I should say, a festal gathering. Oh boy, Guthrie writes, in secular literature, this word was used of parties or the celebratory atmosphere at the annual athletic competition such as the Olympics, which are ending today, I think. In the Septuagint, it speaks of a multitudinous gathering to celebrate an occasion of joy or delight often associated with the feast. So the word communicates a sense of excitement, of revelry, and well-being. And it's the angels. The angels are celebrating. They are parting. Number three. To the assembly of the firstborn inscribed permanently in heaven. The Greek word is ecclesia, which is the word we get the word church from. And, and these are God's new covenant people who share in the inheritance of the Son. The idea of a book with the believer's names in it, written in it is common in Scripture. In fact, even Jesus spoke of it in Luke 10, 20. There's something special about being named in a book. Unless you're the villain, I guess, but... And to a judge who is God of all. Again, the author, the preacher here, puts judge right at the beginning. The context here is judge. God is judge. He is the just God who will bring justice, who will vindicate his people. It's a theme that is very prevalent in scripture. And I was going to read from Psalm 9. You can read it if you want. But it's the sense of God is going to finally make things right. You know, many people stop believing in God because they say, how can a good God allow? And then they fill in the blank and they dismiss God. Well, this week it hit me in a different way. I just thought the opposite idea hit me. The great proof for God is because we need someone who can come and clean this mess up. Because we certainly can't do it. And science and, and effort and, and the belief that we can improve ourselves and become better is just never worked. We need a God who is just and who will come and make things right. 
And so when he names himself as this great compassion and, and loving and, and whatever else he said in, in Exodus uh, 31, I want to say, um, that I read earlier, and then he says, but he brings, you know, he brings judgment to the sins of the father and the, to the third and fourth generation. That is, that is God saying, listen, this is the result of what you did. Your sin is what's caused this. And I'm bringing judgment to that. We need a God who can straighten this mess out, a good judge. Otherwise, there really is no hope. But there is hope. Number five. To the spirits of the righteous persons made perfect. This refers to those who have died, who have been made completely whole. Dad, mom, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. A joyful reality. This week, a, a dear Bible school friend of mine died. He was from Nepal. A joyful reality. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. This has been the preacher's heartbeat. That one for all, Christ died for, once for all, Christ died for our sins. Jesus is what makes this all possible. Jesus is what makes this celebration possible. Jesus is the one who became like us, who, who took on the experience the, of what it was like to be weak as a human being and, and live this life in obedience and journey through that we've studied. I'm not going to go through it all. But it was because of Jesus that the mountain that was insurmountable, that the mountain that was had to be that way because of the people's sin. Jesus made the way forward so that we can be with God. And to sprinkle blood speaking more effectively than the blood of Abel. It's actually quite brilliant, I think. You see, Abel's blood condemned Cain. Abel's blood said, Cain, you're guilty. It brought on condemnation. But Christ's blood has resulted in our forgiveness. And it, as Guthrie writes, cries out that the people of the new covenant are no longer guilty, having been completely cleansed from sin. And this is the joyous Context, the celebration that we are invited to live our lives out of, to celebrate. And perhaps even more importantly, to celebrate when it seems like there's nothing else to celebrate. There's nothing to celebrate. Remember? Perspective, context. Everything can be falling, falling around us. And yet, if we have a context, if we have the proper perspective of what is real, then there can be great joy. Some of the most joyful people are the people who are the most oppressed I've ever met. Which brings us to the preacher's final warning. Both of our contrasts and examples have involved the Word of God. Hebrews began with the Word of God, and it has been permeated throughout the, with the Word of God. in all its many different ways, especially in including Jesus Christ as the Word. And the plea throughout has been this, that his listeners, that we, that me, that we receive the Word of God, that we do not harden our hearts, that we do not walk away, that we do not ignore or treat the Word of God flippantly like Esau did. Because that way is scary. That way involves judgment. And now it is once again presented as a warning. He says, oh, I, oh well, just a second here. Ignore that second line for now. Uh, he says, see to it that you do not disregard the one who is speaking. And here again, the preacher uses this lesser to greater argument. He says, 
For if those who did not escape when they disregarded the one, for since, or if those who did not escape when they disregarded the one who warned them on earth, okay, let me pause for a moment. Because they did not escape when they disregarded what God said to them on earth, how much less will we if we reject the one who warns us from heaven? Preacher is saying, listen, you want to you walk away from Jesus, the word of God. You want to walk away from, from what God has been doing in all of history to lead us to Jesus, to lead you to Jesus. You want to walk away from that and go back to Mount Sinai. Well, look at what happened to the people at Mount Sinai. They never went to the promised land. They died in the wilderness because of their unbelief, because of their hardened hearts. Do not... Do what they did and ignore the word of God. Because if you do, how much greater will be your punishment if you neglect the one who warns you from heaven? At that time, we are told, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, once again, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The phrase, once more, points to the removal of what can be shaken, as of these things having been made, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. He interprets the shaking that God will do once more as, as the eschatological judgment to be visited on the earth at the end of time when the material earth will pass away. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21, all speaks of this time that somewhere along the way, some point in time, God is going to come and make everything right. And he is going to come and judge it, and he's going to shake the earth in judgment. And at that point, only the kingdom of God will remain. And the kingdoms of this world will have been utterly destroyed. Therefore, he says, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. How do we know this? How do we know we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken? Well, that's where faith kicks in. Because who said so? Who said so? Who? Who? God, louder. You're quiet today. Ah! Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Because God has promised. God has spoken. And this is the context we need. Who are you listening to? Let us be thankful, as Colossians 4, 2 says, devote yourselves to pray, being watchful and thankful. It's one of my favorite sermons I preach from this text, where I devote yourselves to prayer because we need God's perspective. Life is hard. It is challenging. And then as we, we, by faith, commit ourselves to live in God's perspective, we need to start watching, where is God working? And then when, when we do that, when we see it, then we give thanks. Last week I mentioned again Anne Voskamp, who... who had several tragedies and awful things happen in her life and she was at a point of great despair and, and then in her study of the word she decided she would take the command to be thankful seriously and how that has transformed her life. And then through our perspective, or through our thanksgiving, let us worship God in a manner of who he, worthy of who he is, with fear and awe. As C.S. Lewis wrote, Aslan is not a tame lion. God is not a tame lion. He's good, he's, he, he cares, he, but he's not a tame lion. And our God is a consuming fire. You see, the author is not saying this is two different gods here. The author is not saying that this god actually realized that he was a bit harsh and he decided he'd become a bit more easy and, and nice god. And uh-uh, this god is the same god. 
The difference is the story, the journey of the story. You see, what is the same, and the proof of that is the fact that, what did he call people to hear? To trust. What did he call people to do here? To listen to him. What did he call people to do here? To obey. To have a heart that is for God. And he does the same thing over here. And what the Hebrew, author of Hebrews has said, and he's taking us through this, again, this doesn't make sense to our minds. But he is saying that somehow, even though all these events have happened in history, the sacrifice of Christ was for all time. God presented in both mountains is the same God. The difference is Jesus. And so we see these two mountains. We see the first covenant. We see the second covenant. And the, and the first mountain is filled with, with, with fear and dread and, and lack of relationship because of the sin in the world, of the sin of the people. But now, in Christ, in the second covenant, because of what Christ has done in the second covenant, we don't, we, we get to have, we get to join in the festive. We get to be part of what's going on in heaven, which is all about relationship. And so, I'm done with asking the question. I'm just going to do what God calls us to. Trust me, he says. Trust me. Live in the reality of my promises. Keep the right perspective by having the right context. That's why we need to live here. Because the world screams something much louder and much more boldly, and it's in our face. Because we watch it, we listen to it, it's all around us. And this seemingly obscure book that's filled with a lot of weird language and weird things keeps us rooted and grounded in the right perspective, helps us to understand the context of what's going on, the context of eternity, but more importantly, the context of God and his saving hand through Jesus Christ, his son, and his Holy Spirit who is at work in this world and in us who believe. And, as, and we can have faith. We can trust because God is faithful and God is trustworthy. Let me say that again. We can have faith and we can trust. Why? Because God is faithful and God is trustworthy. That is, he is worthy of our trust because of who he is. Jesus, in John 16, he... he, he He's speaking to his disciples, and this is just before he's going to his, his death, and he's also looking to, to when um, he's going to be deserted and there's going to be difficulty coming. And he speaks to this in John 16, and he empathizes with what the people are going to go through. He knows that they're going to go through a time in which they think, oh, that's real. what happened here? Jesus was supposed to save us, and he didn't do it. Jesus was supposed to do this. He was supposed to, and, and, and suddenly their dreams were going to be shattered. And he, he wants to reassure them that no, no, you just, you don't have the right context here yet. And you don't have the right perspective. I want to help you with the perspective. So because one day you will understand the context. And he says this. If I can find it here. 
He says, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home, and you will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Then he says this, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, if I were to paraphrase it, say, in this world, I guarantee you, Jesus says, you will have trouble. <laughs> okay? Just, that's, that's the reality. But take heart. Why? Why? What is it? What does Jesus say? Why can I take heart? What? Yes, Lynn, I have overcome the world. But please understand that there is only one person we stand up for here. Only one person that we name. And it is the name of Jesus. So I want us to sing a cappella. I didn't ask Rick to do this. I just thought this is a good song to sing a cappella. Um, maybe someone has never sung this before. I don't know. But it's a beautiful tune, and my wife will correct me if I started off wrong. So that's good. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth 